Hey, everybody, and welcome. This is uh, Barney Kunze coming at you live here from Ontario, Canada. Uh, on the Friday before long weekend, the last long weekend of the summer, at least for those of us that are North Americans, uh, Labor Day long weekend. Now, I don't know, maybe somewhere, for those of you tuning in live, if you're in Australia or Europe, let us know. Um, I've had four people today that I talked to, some of our presenters from the States are like, oh, I don't know about y'all, but we have, a, we have a holiday down here in the States called Labor Day, and we have it too up here in Canada. Um, so it's gonna be a great weekend. And I'm really excited before we get started the long weekend, of course, a uh, couple of things I just want to let you know is that we are uh, excited for this year's summit. And it's our third year, November 7th to the 16th. So if you haven't already gotten signed up yet, um, you can go to, you can just type in animalwellnesssummit.com or I'll, whoops, I will post the link up here so that it's easy for you guys to get a hold of. Um, and you can register for free. If you're new to our community and you don't know how this all works, um, you can absolutely positively register for free and you can also um, register as a paid member um, and buy one of either the recordings in a digital download format or as a flash drive. Um, and then of course you can always um, just do the uh, all access digital pass. So go ahead and get yourself registered for this year's summit, share with your friends, um, and today we have our one of our new presenters for this year um, because the summit, just a quick little recap because we're leading up to the summit. So again, if you're watching this live and you've already heard this, then bear with me. But if you're new, this is gonna be very beneficial. And if you're watching this as a replay in the future after the summit, this will make a lot more sense. So the Animal Wellness Summit is a free online educational event that's completely dedicated to the holistic care of dogs, cats, birds, and horses, and even some other animals like even uh, cows and um, rabbits. So what's really neat about it is that we have a wide variety of um, very educated and experienced and passionate um, educators, experts, um, and technicians that are in the field doing work in the holistic world. And so um, it's free from November 7th to the 16th. You can get there for this year, 2019, get yourself registered. Um, and we have some uh, presenters that are coming online for, again for this year that have presented in the past. Some of them have pre presented all, well, all, they'll be presenting in all three years. So they presented in 2017, 2018, and then again in 2019. But then we also have pretty cool uh, new presenters that are coming on. One that we have on deck today here, uh, her name is Miriam, and she is a pretty interesting and cool story to share with you. So um, what I wanna encourage you to do is as you're coming in um, and coming in the live here, just let us know where you're tuning in from I see uh, Violet says, hi, Barn. <laughs> nice to see you, Violet. Um, and I'm going to bring on Miriam just in just one second. So, Miriam, welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. We're yeah. glad to be part of this. We love yeah. the Animal Wellness Summit, and I've loved uh, learning about the oils and the different lights that we can use, which yeah. we have used in physical therapy as well. Um, it's very, very interesting. We use red light on my son. Awesome. Uh, and he's also the reason we trained a service dog. <laughs> well, very cool. So uh, before we get jumping right into it, why don't you, where are you, um, I, I hope say calling in from, we're not on a big teleconference, we're on Facebook. Where are you guys tuning in live from again? Yes, uh, we're located in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, okay. So um, I have lots of friends in Texas, so there's the, there's the belief there that, that we have uh, two countries, United States and Texas, right? <laughs> least to some, least to some Texans. Um, so you're you're in Dallas now. Tell us, um, you know, there's going to be some people that are going to be jumping on here. Um, you know, by the time the email got out and people got notified on a Friday before a long weekend, a lot of people are going to be coming in on this after as a replay. But also, some people I know have heard of you, um, but there was a point when I didn't know who you were. So I'd love for you to just take a couple minutes. Um, and just kind of tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are um, right now with everything that you're um, Okay. Yeah. I'm Miriam, and this is Victor. And I'm a stay-at-home yeah. mom, but I was trained as a physical therapist and exercise physiologist. And I've always just loved dogs. And my best friend when I was a little kid was my dog, and we would pretend circus. And then I would have her do tricks. And my our... Family recycles concrete, and we have a um, 
whole bunch of rubble. And after the Oklahoma City bombing, people noticed that that would be a great place to train dogs for the first search and rescue dogs. So I had kind of been exposed to dog training um, at a you know a beginner level of is they had never had the search and rescue dogs where they had a same protocol you know to train all the dogs. So that got me interested and more I guess um, confident that this you know what could be done with a dog and my son got sick with uh, Crohn's disease and we heard of a diet called specific carbohydrate diet and so we wrote a book Victor helped me with writing a book under a pen name Shannon Evanson called gut feeling gut healing is how we learned about this diet and helped my son but right before he got fully on the diet he was in the hospital so many times uh, about 11 and we had just gotten a puppy and we realized wow this is kind of out of control 11 times in the hospital in one summer we got to stop to this and I didn't really want to do Humera, but I had a friend who was using a service dog for seizures and I thought, well, how can we help with Crohn's? And some people had said, oh, maybe we can teach him to tell him 30 minutes before a flare and he can maybe make it to the restroom. But I was like, I don't want him to have a flare. So luckily I had a lot of background in reading research articles and such. So I was able to Anyways, figure out how to teach the dog to smell for the diet. Wow. So, um, okay, well, before I ask you to expand a little bit more on this, so, uh, Victor, you kind of got right in the camera there. So why don't you tell us, um, first of all, I think I already said hi, but hello. Hey. Yeah. Um, so why don't you tell us, um, because you helped, like, how you contributed to the book as well. So I got involved um, with the project, I want to say about three years ago, two years ago, um, I actually started doing some work for Miriam and her husband, and we we all had a common bond. And I, she knew that I loved to write. Uh, she found that out early on, and she would never say this, but Miriam grows humans. She people come into her life, and she figures out what their dreams or their passions are, and she raises them up. It's it's really cool, which played yeah. I think a major role in how the project was born, you know, right. there was a, a organization that they were affiliated with and um, came to know a family that had significant ailments among many of their children and even, even the mother herself and uh, kind of took them under her wing. And we started the, you know, we started the project. We got involved with the uh, Novacek 86 Labradoodles, 84, 84 <laughs> sorry, Novacek 84 Labradoodles. And then yep. we continued to go from there. And with the experience of gut feeling, gut healing, kind of being on, you know, in the, in the background of that, we transitioned over and like, why don't we, you know, write about this entire story and get more people involved. And Miriam was like, well, why don't you co-author it this time? Why don't you share your experience? Right when she got uh, Stella, yes. I had <laughs> I tried to say it wasn't an emotional support situation, but I had just gotten out of a relationship. I was living by myself, and I uh, spontaneously went and got a dog. <laughs> yeah, and I over time grew to understand what I was doing and <laughs> the emotional support the dog played in my life, and being exposed to and the, the trainers, you know, from, from Miriam's like being over there, I started to pick up on a lot of different things. It was like, you know what, there's something to all of this. I want to, I want to train my dog. I, I'd like for him to learn, you know, a single task so he could be a licensed service animal, but also serve as an emotional support animal with the changes in the law and, you know, everything. And he needs to have a, a specific task. And I realized, yeah, he's, it's really become an emotional companion in my life. And it was all born out of the project that we, we started together. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So you guys worked on the, for, on the book. So let me clarify again, just so that it, cause um, when we do our Facebook lives, I've learned that if I don't make things clear, um, our support desk usually blows up after doing a, a Facebook call or Facebook live with the proper information. So it's the, the book was, did you, you said it's um, gut feeling, gut healing. That's uh, correct. 
<clears throat> and I saw that I'm looking at it right now, blending specific carbohydrate diet, whole food nutrition, and a holistic lifestyle. Yes. Um, and that says Shannon Evanson. Correct. Yeah, my son was still in high school in a small area of town, and they, he just didn't want everybody to know about his diagnosis now. Oh, I see. Okay. <clears throat> So, so that works because that, I was wondering, I'm like, if that, but that makes sense. So it was like, a, yeah. there's a lot that goes on with Crohn's <laughs> for, for a kid in high school. It can be a lot to expose to. It's a D Dallas as big as it is, is, is a little bit small, especially it's small. Yeah, no, I get that. So you started on that one and then the dog invests. Um, when I, <laughs> I, this is just the way my brain works. Okay. Clearly it shows how my, where my hierarchy of values are. When I looked at it, I'm like dog invests. I'm like that. I'm like wonder wonder what they're investing in. You're right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like dog invests. Like, are they into financial planning or what? When I, <laughs> I, I love <laughs> it. I love but then it. I finally like, oh yeah, it's dogs in vests. And right. then I saw the book. So that was the next thing. So those the the book, um, not investing dogs on Wall Street, but we're talking about dogs in vests. Um, so, to, so the the book is essentially like a compilation of stories. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. What I've been able to gather so far um, was like a collection of stories of just kind of like the evolution or the process of families that have started embracing really training and teaching their dogs to be licensed service dogs and kind of everything that goes along with it. Is that kind of right? That's, that's very accurate. Yes. Okay. And the, yeah, the stories of the families was what he was saying. We knew a child that also had gut issues that spent maybe 50 days in the hospital a year. And wow. we were just like, wouldn't it be great to have some emotional support or have a dog in the hospital? But obviously I was going to go for pet partners at first with our puppy when we got it, even before my son was sick. And that would be because I was a physical therapist. And I thought, oh, this would be a great way to give back you know, just take a dog to visit the hospital. And then I'm like, well, every hospital has their own contract with which dogs could go in. And I'm like, well, it would really be sad to have a dog that could be a, a therapy dog and can't even visit my own son when he's in the hospital. Yeah, right. So um, that's how we started going a little bit deeper on what needed to be done. But we realized this other child, Karis Laidwig, who also helped write in the book, um, she was in there and homeschooled and advanced and liked literature and books and that's how she escaped the reality and the time in the hospital so we thought we had just written the first book we had a little bit under our belt and we said wouldn't it be great if she could really feel empowered and help write this book with us we i'll make it happen i promised her i'll tell you what i'll make it happen if you help write this book from the puppy's perspective and we will use the training that our dog got and have our dog help teach a sister a sibling from the same <clears throat> and yeah. I'm pretty confident that if it's related that closely, I can probably get it done. <laughs> and with my dog can help teach all the unspoken things that dogs teach each other. And it worked beautifully. And she uh, co-authored the book and just is thriving. And it's, it's really beautiful. And she has not spent nearly as many days in the hospital, maybe 13 the year after, after having her dog and just, the dog is alerting and keeping her out of the hospital. So it's pretty great. Wow. Yeah. So that's pretty. So what did she, what was, what did she have again? She had, um, well, they call it complete intestinal failure, but she also has adrenal issues. So it's Addison's yeah. disease with that. And um, her, her sister, they're on TPN pumps, so they don't eat food. So I was like, how am I going to train these? puppies for these people, you know, what can we teach them? But they get exhausted with the adrenal issues and we can teach yeah. the dog to like, retrieve things and bring things to them. But it just so happened that the dog was an automatic alerter to the adrenal issue because Amy Novacek has the same problem. And the dogs were puppies, the parents were puppies when the issue came on for her. So even before they mated, they were already smelling these different body chemistries. And then the pregnant mom was smelling the body chemistries. And then the puppies, after they were born, were, you know, for eight weeks on the ranch and being handled by Amy and the family. And they were starting to to be sensitized to all that. Right. Yeah, that's, um, it, I think when one of the things that we talked about before, 
uh, about your presentation. So, I mean, we'll get to that a little bit, a bit of a sneak peek for those of you wondering. Um, there may uh, or may not be some education about uh, training service dogs um, for your self to learn from Marin's presentation and that's what they're working on that this is Barney's way of making a little joke and saying that that's exactly what's coming down the pipeline um but so without giving it all away can you tell us a little bit um you know because you want to be able to share and empower those that are listening because I think that there's a lot of uh, I wouldn't say misinformation but just a lot of there's not enough information at least from my perspective anyways about like actually like what is a service dog because I mean the first image so just to back, use an analogy, when I first started learning about essential oils, I had somebody, this is like 10, 11 years ago, the first thing that came to mind was just, oh, like, you know, going to a spa or going to a salon or um, like lavender oil or like oils you put in your bathtub. And I was kind of like, what? Like, I didn't really get it at first. And now my perspective of essential oils is totally, after using them 10 years on thousands and thousands of people, clients, members, myself, and people that we've helped uh, share them with, um, totally different so when i first talk to somebody i'm using this as a little bit of an analogy um about essential oils are kind of like what like what the what like what are you talking about like 5w30 essential oil or like <laughs> you know, like efa dha um and no and and it's just getting some clarity so i think there's when you say service dog can you help give a, a, a good explanation of like the the common misconceptions with the service dog because i think that's a lot of what um, and again, I'm totally presuming here, just getting to know your story and the work that you guys are doing, but that's uh, one of the big benefits to learning more about this is that there's a lot of misinformation and kind of maybe just not enough information about service dogs. Yeah, we we actually ran into that a few different times. And what was really helpful was when I started asking a lot about emotional support animals, you know, because there's, there, of course, there's a difference between a service animal and a difference between an emotional support animal and the blend is what i mean has started to cause a lot of problems if you saw like what was going on in the airlines people were bringing on emotional support Peacock. peacocks and <laughs> whatever <laughs> else that started to i mean they can bring ponies they're miniature ponies actually they are service ponies they're they're because they service live ponies. longer they live at least 20 years wow on the bulkhead they can be there and yes. they I think the primary factor, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, from what I learned from Valerie was they have to provide a task. Right. They have to be trained and provide a task, preferably two, specific to the illness and mitigating it for the person that has the disability. Okay. And um, they... Um, the training is a series, you know, a series of training um, that they have. It's a canine good citizen test. Right. Is what they have to pass. They passed that, and then we passed um, a public access test, and then met the criteria for IAADP, which is an international service dog, um, I guess licensing. So if you were flying to a different country, you wouldn't quarantine your animal when you got off the plane. So we just. Valerie was a trainer that works um, at Canine Solutions Dallas that has helped us. And then she'd come once every two weeks or once a week and help me fine tune anything that I wasn't able to break down into a small enough steps. But uh, the emotional support animal has legal rights to go on a plane with you and to live in an apartment with you. That's, that's it. Now, of course, <laughs> anywhere a dog's allowed to be on a public patio, they're allowed to be there, yeah. but they're not really allowed to go shopping in the stores with you. A pet therapy animal is allowed to be working like at a home, a school, or a college campus to be read just to. Just church. Or right. Right, churches and, oh, just a second. And then um, they are there for a limited amount of time and the trainer has to be fully concentrated on the animal and is looking for any signs of stress to make sure that they have to carry a million dollar insurance policy on the animals to make sure they don't, you know, eat something or knock something over that could be catastrophic. Yeah, could be dangerous, yeah. Yep. And then um, the, so a service animal does the, uh, you know, can behave in public and doesn't get out of control and doesn't have aggression towards others and um, then does the tasks to help that person. But, they don't have to be trained by a facility. The owner can train their own service dog. 
So that was a, uh, an emotional support, the last one you were saying, right? No, no the last one was, um, no, a, a service dog can actually be owner trained, which is why we are raising the awareness about that. So I owner trained with the help of a trainer, uh, but normally you get on a wait list for, like Guide Dogs for the Blind has a wait list maybe one and a half to three years, and that costs them over $100,000 to train each animal. and they give those animals are given they're donated but when you go say to look for a diabetic alert dog you could pay up to thirty thousand dollars from a, a facility that trains the dogs for scent and they would have maybe gone to puppy raising with a foster family first and then so you don't know if it's a hit or miss something could happen when you thought you were having a dog that's getting close and then right. it all falls apart and then even though you paid your money you're still waiting for another year Right. Right. So that's that's the big obviously one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges obviously is the finances and then just the time involved. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so so then so tell us a little bit more about this side the about the owner so owner raised service dogs because that's the that's the key is just to really get that empowerment education out there, right? Right. First that it exists. And yeah. that, um, you know, if you find the right dog, you can train it yourself and you'll have a stronger bond with that dog. And sometimes you can find that at a pound. Preferably, they said to look for um, show dogs, maybe would have cleared their hips and eyes and stuff like that to be show dogs is a good place to look. But um, sometimes the rescue dogs make good dogs as well. And, you know, there's different... Um, I, don't, I can't name them all, but like you can check for their, if you drop something, if they're skittish or not, and if they um, work well for um, attention or treats, if they're motivated to want to work, if they um, are, you know, get along with all people and other animals, that's always a great start. And um, in the process, you know, of owner training it, something I realized, I mean, specifically the time that the time that is involved is, you know, what's hard for a lot of people. I was fortunate enough when I got Malachi, um, I was working at a dog park <laughs> three days a week and he, I got him at six weeks old. Um, I rescued, I, I say I rescued him from a family out in uh, Keller. They, they had like 10 puppies and couldn't afford to get everything done for all the puppies that needed to get done. So Right. I got him. And in terms of like loyalty and growing with an animal, I had so much time at home to sit and do what I considered just to be like basic training, you know, like high five, lay down, sit, stay, um, yeah. basic commands, which certainly helped when bringing him into Miriam's environment with highly, highly trained dogs that literally will open and shut their own door to let themselves out to use the bathroom. Like, <laughs> Her, wow. dog, her dogs can do all sorts of incredible things and teaching each other is, is a huge part of that as well. When we first started with Stella, there was a lot of training involved, a lot of different tasks, a lot of work with Valerie, um, a lot of different techniques that Miriam used from her experiences training animals. And then when uh, Maisie came along, yeah. it, it felt like Maisie picked up training oh, very, fast. very fast especially the scent training mm -hmm. she did yeah that was really great like i said that we spent over 18 months trying to figure out how to teach stella these really intricate starches so to teach Maisie just low blood sugar was one thing versus 16 different starches and low blood sugar really isn't in a the same kind of settings it's always in a human body whereas i'm trying to tell you tell me if you see it by itself or in a cake or if it's in a salad dressing you know like so many different ways to right. present so that made that much much easier and we read a book called the ping project which was super beneficial to me and it's by sherry finger and i think i might have it right here um she had a book called the ping project and okay. i learned a ton from that and i learned a whole bunch from um, and what, what's the, in a nutshell what's the ping project again the ping project is how to tra train um, your own diabetic alert dog and it was showing how to um, capture the scent and that you can get it off of your um, 
So that was from your spit, the saliva, yeah. and you can put it inside uh, toys or different um, under the strainer. That was huge for me, so that your dog is being imprinted to how to uh, recognize that. And what I mean by imprinted is when they smell it in a toy, they want to tell you about it because toys mean fun, and I want to tell you and. Right. That toy always comes and we play when I smell that smell. Then if I smell that smell, I'm going to come tell you that I smell that smell. Okay. Same way you would almost notice if coffee was brewing, you're going to say, oh, maybe it's time to wake up. Right? So when they. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love coffee. Same. So, um, that was helpful for that. And then I learned a book that. Uh, or, there was one called The Other End of the Leash, and I'm sorry I forgot who wrote it, but yeah. it was really cool because the dogs and monkeys and humans are about the most, um, I don't know, it, they socialize on a level. They said like a dog could literally go into Congress and know who's the head honcho and what's going on and who's running the show. Yeah, to establish, uh, the, wired. to establish the the. I think what you were, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, you said monkeys, humans, yeah. and dogs. And I think because it's mainly that uh, we're pack yeah. you know, animal, animals or mammals and that we're wired to um, Thrive. You know, to have hierarchy. And yeah. kind of, you know, to kind of know like there's that kind of built in hierarchy or kind of like the alpha, um, so to speak, but also learning and very curious based. Right, and then I'm totally off, but that's just what I got when you were talking. No, I'm just I was just saying that it's teaching you a little bit more of understanding how a dog might be thinking of the situation where yeah. it might be seeing it totally differently. And that, um, anyways, we we enjoyed that. And this uh, dog mission from Duke University, Brian Hare has these fun games that anybody can play, and that's how we ended up for sure deciding we were going to train Stella for. Um, be a service animal because he has a seven layers of what your dog's able to learn based on how they respond to these different um, cones. Like say we put two uh, actually cups upside down and put the dog across the room about 15 feet away and I put a treat under one cup and I let her watch me put them down and she's over on the other side and then I point to the cone of the treats and I say, okay, find it. And she goes to uh, which one? Does she go to the one that I point to? Does she take a cue from me? Or does she go, wait, I saw you put it under the other one. You know, right. and so you set this up. And so you find out where's the loyalty version versus where's their independent, I'm going to do whatever I want version. Schnauzers, you know, are very independent. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. And um, so she ended up being what they called an ace, which meant she would think independently. But if you, she she still wants to perform for you. And if I had pointed with my foot, she would go get it because it was a new way to teach her. But if I pointed with my finger, she never went to it. She's like, I know where it is. But if I changed how I cued oh. her, then she's like, well, why did she cue me different? Something's up. Let me pay attention. So right. she'd be a good dog if somebody was going to pass out to problem solve. She would think, oh, I need to get help, like, by herself. Whereas, yeah, unbelievable. you know, there are some dogs that are just the most loyal companions and won't leave your side. And they'll just say, you need help, but they're not going to leave you. Right. They're just, right. you're not going to get that help, but right. they're going to be as good as they can to help. Yeah, you. Right. Yeah. So she ended up being really high on the list. And so that's when all this, I guess, took off. I said, yes, I'm going to train another dog for somebody else because why waste all this energy that we put into her? Let's give the gift forward. Such a Yeah. Now is the, which is, that's just really cool. I mean, when, I mean, it's stuff that the information exists and it's out there and, and I just was, to put this here, um, Norman said, I have a service dog. So, I mean, there's people that are out there that have service dogs. Um, and then I think there's that have the experience and have maybe gone through the whole um, training and, and the time involved and um, however that all works. But then there's the other side of um, just learning all of the different things that you can do or that service dogs can do. That was one of the things that you said to me when we talked on the phone, I think, recently, mm -hmm. which is that there is there's so many things that you can teach um, a service dog to do to help, you know, just if, if you are in trouble or something happens that they, they know what to do. And it's just, 
I think on the surface, to, you know, for the most part, there's a common assumption, not that dogs and animals aren't smart, because I think the majority of us, especially for those of us on the call and on this in our community know that, but that is a general, I'm going to say this presumption in society that, um, that animals and specifically dogs don't get as much credit. But then when you see what they can do right. um, in situations like this, it brings that to the forefront. I'm like, wow, like these are, it's pretty powerful, right? Absolutely. Dogs are like, I look at Malachi, he's like my kid, you know, yeah. he, he has a potential, <laughs> you know, he, I, I know that given a purpose, like when I, when I go to work, you know, like I thrive, I enjoy what I do. It's, it's, it's a passion and it's really cool. And, you know, when dogs are, you know, when Stella, we get the vest out and she's like ready to go to work, you know, it's, it's cool to see that they can do everything from rescue someone from an avalanche to find drugs in an airport to, you know, go alert someone that, I mean, literally before, it's with a diabetic, it's from the sweat, right? It's and the breath. Even. And the breath. Like before yeah. something even happens they can to tell about 15 them. minutes before the glucometer, like if they're wearing one on their arm shows the drop. Wow. Like why, you know, why not help a dog? <laughs> I, I dare I say, find, find its purpose outside of just being an incredible yeah, right. pet. Yeah. Like, because you could, somebody could hear that and think, Oh, well that's to, that could be a, a an assumption that a dog doesn't have purpose or that they don't have purpose if they're not doing that. But it's just, you know, they, they want to, we want to have that support and uh, the connection that we have with our animals. And that's just to be able to connect with them on another level and to find that. Um, yeah. And we just wanted to open up to people that you don't have to be completely in a wheelchair or blind or totally hearing impaired. We're, they're finding dogs for food allergies or diabetes. That's not, you know, constant. I mean, it is, but it's not, um, like you're not independent enough to walk or get, you know, have a job or something like that. So as we're learning more things, the there's going to be more service dogs probably that we're finding in society. Right. And um, so I think the awareness will happen, but there's so many people that are having seizures or, and aren't able to find medicine that's helping them. And, you know, that's pretty serious. If they have a seizure and they don't know ahead of time, they can fall and hit their head. That could be the end of it. Right. Yeah. Or you could, um, you know, fall off a dock, you know, or in a swimming pool, or they could also, you know, just be taken advantage of if they, you know, are in a public place that they could just take their wallet or, you know, yeah. this is maybe not the best. So you'd want to have a dog with you and then they're not so sheltered. They don't have to live right. Just in a, only these people that really know me well, that I trust yeah. only go to their parties. And so. right. Yeah. That makes sense too. Like just with the social, socialization or just in, in expanding their if you could say it expanding their doggy sphere where they could just kind of have a bigger you know a, a capacity to interact with even more humans and more animals yeah um, i mean and because they're all they're like humans too or some are get along are really good in public and with others and some aren't and that's just like an a, an example of like an introvert and an extrovert right um so Tell us uh, a little bit more about, so some of the common things that people will use a service dog for are usually, as you've said, are like a physical disability or just um, whether it be with uh, diabetics for blood sugar, uh, people that have the propensity to get seizures on a semi or regular basis. But what are some of the things that you, and pardon me if you would name them all already, but I, I think it'd be really neat to mention so. A, a, like a, a short list even of some of the different things that, that you guys have been able to discover through your research, but also that dogs can be, that they can be trained for. Like what are some right. other examples? And they do um, cancer detection they're using in the hospitals now for, um, they're hoping to make a machine that can smell like a dog after uh, the dogs are detecting even skin cancers. Um, and they use them for um, arthritis, disability, but not like they can't walk, but it's if they kept bending down and hyper, um, also blood pressure issues. A lot of people are having this syndrome called POTS, which is an orthostatic um, 
well, it's basically related to blood pressure. And if you bend over, you could, would be lightheaded and faint, right. um, possibly. So that is where the dog can bend over and pick that up for you so that you don't have that risk of fainting. Okay. And um, then I can also alert you before you could faint so that you could sit down and not fall as well. And so they're just finding, you know, of course we have the search and rescue and the drug alert dogs and such, but we're just, we want people to know, even if your dog isn't a service dog, as in can't um, be out in public everywhere and behave, they could still probably enjoy having a task at home. Like our other dog gets the newspaper every morning and just loves to, she's so proud of herself to come in and get her morning breakfast after she gets the paper. And right. you know, it's, she, you could just, see it all over her, her tail's wagging. She's excited to have a trot going on. And so we're just encouraging people to learn from us that your dogs are want to work. I want to say from, from a millennial generation standpoint and rise of mental health awareness, right? Yeah. I have a lot of friends that caught on, especially once Malachi traveled with me. They were like, how, you know, the, the original question sometimes is, oh, well, how do I make my, my dog an emotional support animal? I'm like, do you need emotional support? A, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, there's a little bit more to it. I, I had a psychologist that prescribed it, you know, prescribed Malika as a service animal, essentially wrote a letter of documentation yeah. saying that um, it benefit me. And when I travel, I took Malachi to Virginia with me somehow between, I don't know what happened between 25 and 32, but I used to travel all the time and never have any issues. And all of a sudden I just being on a plane, thinking about everything, the physics, everything. I was just like, this is weird that this can happen. And I started to experience anxiety and it was incredible bringing Malachi on the plane after a couple of different plane rides, whereas my heart starts racing and I'm just kind of like, you know, Malachi just, little legs right there on my lap just looks at me you know will lick my hand and it just it completely changed the dynamic of the entire flight right and also i had a little bit of fear of how other people were going to react you know he's he's a 54 pound dog and you know it's smaller seating arrangements I, I wasn't up in first class i was in the bulkhead and so i was just wondering how other people would respond and through i think two or three times with them i've never had a bad experience Malachi always stayed right in his space. He's he's trained well, and the people sitting next to me were enthralled. Like, really wanted to learn more about it, and thought it was super cool that he was able to assist me in that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. It's just, and again, it's just something to um, expand the the knowledge of uh, and and awareness about a what you guys are doing, and that's really where why the why we exist and kind of put this event together was just to bring like-minded people that have something to share with those who care and it's just neat to be able to share the information through the power of the internet and that's what's neat about our event um and the community is that i mean like we had um noor on here from paris saying hello from paris awesome. um, <laughs> want to do it do an exchange you can come to canada and i'll go to paris for a bit <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, we're definitely going to be going, um, moving somewhere either in Europe or Australia or out west or somewhere in the states for two or three months. Oh wow! Because I can work w with what I do with my marketing. We can work anywhere, um, and so it's it's kind of neat just to go and explore different places. But I'm getting off point here. the The reasoning for me saying that is just that it's neat. I'm excited to learn more from your presentation. Um, and, and just the, the empowerment that can come with it. So this book, um, where's the best place for people to find the book? Because I know that um, you mentioned, yeah, that this is, yeah, let me pull this up here for a second. I'm gonna take myself off the screen. Um, so Dog Invests, and where is the best place to find it? Well, um, it's on Amazon, but Barnes & Noble has it. It has its own US or IBN number, whatever it is, sorry. Um, but it's, uh, so any place can order it. Yep. Any small mom and pop bookshop can order it. And uh, it's also like on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and most big mm -hmm. reads. Yeah. And okay. the iBooks available. Cool. So, and yeah. is, 
Is it in, did you guys get it into, uh, did you say Audible? Because you, you cut out there for a second. No, it's not Audible yet. It's okay. Is the plan to get it into Audible or you have, have plans to do that? I haven't gotten that far yet. We have um, another dog that we're kind of working on that's Stella's nephew that um, we were going to train for seizure alerts for a friend of my son's. Uh, but he has um, had a little hiccup with his eyesight and so yeah. now we're keeping him. He's on a um, list to have a procedure, which is pretty exciting. The dogs are teaching me things. I mean, even about science that people and dogs apparently have day blindness, which means you go outside and everything gets so bright that it's like, I guess when you first leave the eye doctor, you, you almost can't see it hurts your eyes and you need to wear those special sunglasses for several hours after you're dilated. Okay. Um, so he, uh, they, anyways, they do a gene where they take a virus and put a gene, the virus eats the old gene and leaves a new gene. And then the dogs can see, they've seen for up to three years now with this one procedure. Uh, Captain has a little bit variation of that and they're working on the protocol for that, but they think it's going to be the same. And so he's in line for that. But what's neat is it made his nose stronger that he can't see maybe quite as well. Okay. Uh, so we know whatever we do, if, if he can't get his eyes fixed, then he would definitely be somebody that would be perfect for like a seizure, somebody that needs to be right next to you all the time and tell you right away, right? That would right. be, um, whereas Stella, you know, she's kind of more strong-willed, as I told you from the dognition test, she's gonna think a little bit for herself. And so she would wanna be completely tied to me all the time, right? She, right. So it's great that she just checks food allergens and we need her when we go to grocery stores or to out to eat for restaurants or when we're just not sure if some of the food in the pantry got contaminated with somebody else's food type of thing. Um, and of course the potlucks at church. <laughs> but, yeah, right. um, <laughs> so yeah, so we're learning all about vision and even the blue light, which you're getting off your screen or we're getting overhead, you're out in the sunlight, which is great. But it's even led us to learn about light and that it matters and that we right. should wear these uh, blue light blocking glasses and so I usually uh, have mine on actually and I have a red lamp we got a red lamp and I have the orange lights and we did a video called light really matters that's just a song on YouTube it's just kind of a fun little thing yeah that, to educate people because we learned so much from captain and then my son actually got um, he ordered the glasses for him and they have the blue light blocking and his, some of his inflammation numbers went incredibly down. So, and who was that then? Um, my son with Crohn's. Okay. Yeah. So the light actually was affecting part of his inflammation and being on the screens all the time playing video. Yeah, well, it's a huge 10. So my background is in holistic health in the human world. Um, and I own, gyms uh, for 12 years and that's my my passion so I started right. learning about holistic health and well-being and that's what I was kind of my background and then growing up on the farm and uh, and I I always kind of I would have that where I used to um, I used to have uh, ski goggles when I would be at home and I would be on the computer this is back in the day with like Ooh, big, yeah. big tube like giant computer monitors the snow yellow a little bit right yeah well I, I they were orange these ones were orange and i would just put them on because i found them really bright and then uh and then i did we were I, we went somewhere and i put my goggles on. <laughs> and a couple of my buddies made fun of like what are you doing you do goggles on and then after now the one guy he was on a, a computer is like a computer nerd and he has eye issues because he was on a computer a lot for a long time Right. And, and it is. So all that to say that the light for sure. I mean, I had it where I put the blue light goggle or goggles, the glasses on. They're just, they look like regular glasses, but there's yeah. no prescription in them. They just have that film on it. And other than the fact that when it's nighttime and I put them on and I'm talking to somebody on the screen, it's hard because then the glare reflects off the glasses. Oh, right. But they're, but it's amazing. Like how much less strain i feel in my my neck muscles my ocular muscles my suboccipital muscles back here and up i it's unbelievable and i thought it was just me yeah but well, i put them on and i'll yawn in 30 minutes and i'm somebody that usually has trouble sleeping so right. yeah so we had researched that and listened to 
Jack Cruz and Dr. Pollock and read a lot of the books that they had suggested. And just like I said, by chance, noticed my son's inflammation went down as well. Wow. And he's still following the diet 100 percent. But um, we were like, we need to share this also. So Victor's in the video and my son is at, one of my sons is at Nashville and he uh, in Belmont. Yeah. And he sings. And so we had him do the singing for the song. And I wrote, you know, the science somewhat lyrics you know in a melodious tune and yeah. just to put it out there to help people try to grasp that yeah we need to we need to pay attention to the whole thing every right. process, it's a holistic wellness i i believe as you do yeah 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 well that's pretty that's pretty neat well there's lots that we're gonna obviously learn in the presentation um now in in the in the presentation coming up in the summit that's going to be aired in 2019 um in the book, you mentioned a couple times about this test um, that this, who was it, a doctor or somebody that they would do a test to determine whether or not a dog could be a service dog um, or some, it, it was like seven things that you would, they would look for to see if, do you, do you know what I mean? When you were talking about this earlier? Confusing two of them. One of them was the Duke Dognition test that okay. was for the seven levels of how smart is your dog and how will they want to learn. So yeah. Taught you that was a great way to learn if you had a dog that was, had potential. That would be a very quick way to screen a dog. Say you have a three year old dog, you're wondering, wow, could I still train him? I would highly recommend to, I think it's like $70 to do all their testing and have a month subscription to the games that they teach you to play with your dog to okay. interact. I think that's, I mean, that would be a great way just to know how to teach them to be successful, what's their learning style. And it shows you different games for different learning styles. And yeah. that's really cool. And obviously yeah. you have to know that your dog out, you know, wasn't scared, didn't run away, wasn't aggressive by you know, by three years old. I would think you would know most of these things. So it would boil down yeah. to that part. And and that so that's what I was referring to and asking about. So where is that that what's in your book or you that is <laughs> it's um it's a resource. Okay. It, it's it's dog mission like cognition. Yep. Com, I think is where you find it and okay. from Duke University, Brian Hare, who um, created that test. And then to become a service animal, it's important, I, from my understanding, to get licensed by someone who's insured and bonded. Um, do you mean? As a service animal, like. Well, I have insurance on Stella in case something happens to her separate that I have okay. from my house insurance and stuff. In, in case, but you don't have to have an actual card or proof that it's a service dog. They can't ask for that. And you hear that. That's a common misconception. Yep. Your dog doesn't even have to wear a vest. There are some states that require either a tag or a collar, but um, they're not required to uh, have a vest. Right. So they can only ask you, is this a service dog and what service do they perform? And so they're usually looking to see how has the dog behaved. And that's a lot of what I'm going to show you on the uh, summit is, yep. you know, what to look for, how to get the basics down to know that <clears throat> your dog's bonded. Well, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to go fake a service dog right away, but it just helps you to know, um, you know, what, what part of what's going to be the journey look like, I guess. And if you want to just have a really well-behaved dog, what that would look like as well and how to train that. So that, yeah, that's, that's really good. That's, I think that's going to be helpful because I think, you know, when you said uh, about people, you know, there's just all these questions that I never really thought to think about or ask at all that are going to go through people's heads when they're thinking about this or do I want to do this or could my dog be a service dog? Could I work with them? I want to you know, build a stronger bond and connection with them that this is a great journey to consider going on and in doing so, having this information is definitely going to be helpful. Sure. And for sure, like we had said earlier, that the dog could do a task at home. Might not be a service dog, but would be, okay, so my friend's dog detects uh, blood sugar for the husband at night. So he goes on planes with them, you know, to um, destinations, et cetera. But at work, he uses the blood sugar that's on your arm. He doesn't want to have a dog at work. And so it's not the dog isn't used all the time like you would think 24-7 the dog has to be with you. Right. And dog, um, dogs trained well enough, but they don't have the dog do anything but just be with them when they travel and be at night. So right. 
it's, you would never see it if they went out to eat at a restaurant or anything like that. So the people are using them in different purposes, but that same dog could have, wouldn't necessarily have to be as well behaved is what I'm saying. Right. Like, up at night, they can still do amazing services. And I think that's fairly easy to train because if the dog has a long nose, not, not a pug nose, but a long nose, they can smell a thousand times more than we can smell. Yeah. So if we break it down and that's what dog nation does, it helps you communicate to your dog and know, are they getting the message? Is this the right way? Or should I be using my foot instead of my finger? Cause I wasn't reading if she was getting the message. I want you to pay attention to that. You know, Right. So we had to, I don't know if we jumped through hoops, but we got very creative and it took a long time to try to, cause Stella got bored and she literally it was like, why did you ask me that? I told you five times I'm done and walk away. And so we weren't sure. Did she really know it? <laughs> did she not know it? What are we doing here? <laughs> and, and so, so I was always second guessing. And I was like, did I wink at her? Am I cueing her off? And we brought in extra trainers just to make sure that I wasn't, that wasn't just a, yeah, um, a learned technique. Oh, I happen to wink every time when it's all clear or something. Because you know? right. <laughs> dogs, like we said earlier, are social. Yeah. And they pick up on these social cues, like I said, if they could tell in the Congress who's running the thing. So they pick up on things we don't pick up on. Oh, she's a little bit less stressed. It's all clear. Or, oh, she's, you see what I'm saying? Like they might learn it. Oh, every time she shows me that, there's a paper towel. So when I smell a paper towel, I'll alert to a paper towel. Like, right. Know, train it wrong. Theory. Right. And so we brought in a ton of people that, check all that yeah well that's i think that's going to be the important part is really just having that empowerment to know um you know just a lot of this because i think that it's going to open up a new world for a lot of people personally right it, yeah. it matters so much even how long your leash is if your leash is uh 10 feet longer a bomb dog won't get the same results as if it was you know say he always has it at six feet and then they give him a longer leash they're not going to get the same reading at all right because the wind blowing and the smells are just different than what they're used to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, that's going to be, I think really just, I don't know, it's going to be neat. And I had mentioned this before, you know, we're, we're currently, you know, have a dog in our house right now. Unfortunately, our little, uh, Lucy, uh, ran away. We don't know what happened. She got, she got sick, really, really sick and um like throwing up and diarrhea and we you know we're going to put her in the garage um this was almost a year ago i actually just posted this on, on the facebook page just saying that it was kind of bizarre where before we've had her had lucy and we've had her had her in our family for i don't know three or four years uh, i think closer to four and um and then it was national dog day not too long ago and i didn't post anything on the page and somebody asked me like hey you didn't uh, post anything. I'm like, I know because it was like national. That was two days before when it happened a year ago um, with Lucy. And basically she just, we put her in the garage to clean up her, her um, house or her, her room. And then she in the garage. Uh, my girls just got up Okay. <laughs> and my wife's not here. So they think it's funny to distract daddy when he's on a Facebook live. But just hang on girls. Um, and it, and then basically she just, we put her in the garage to let her get better while we were cleaning or not like just for like 20 minutes while we were cleaning up her room and then she got unwell again in the garage and then she we opened the garage door and she just bolted and we never came back so we don't know what happened i'm so sorry but, yeah but anyway so when we i'm just saying when we get go we've been really thinking a lot about and I, my girls love dogs and love animals so like when we get another dog we're we're just really looking forward to bringing them bringing them into our house. <laughs> so. Yeah, and now you have all these different fun games you'll be able to play with. Your daughters will be engaged in it, and you'll be able to use, hopefully, a lot of what you've just learned from us. <laughs> yeah, that would be really cool, and I look forward to doing that. Um, and uh, so I think in closing here, because we usually like to do this around an hour, and this not only is it time on the call, but also because... I, I'm sensing some mass chaos start to brew here in the household. <laughs> Usually my wife's home right now, but, um, <laughs> um, but you know, <laughs> come on. Uh, so can you let us know where I posted your link 
uh, the website, but where's the best place that people want to reach out if they have questions other than on the website on doginvests.com? Uh, where else can they reach out to oh, you? Right. We, have, we have a Facebook, uh, but it's at Service Dogs and Training. Hours. That's okay. the place where we didn't get our dogs and vests. Um, on Instagram, it's dogs underscore and underscore vests. Okay. So Messenger on Instagram or um, Facebook would work That's as well. Website. Okay. So you should email through the website too. I think your email is, I think his is Victor at, at dogsandvests.com as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, and then the book. So then, getting the book um, is on best place to get it is just on Amazon. Right, and, and, and the YouTube a video. Um, there's an interview with Dr. Becker on YouTube under Dogs Invest. And yeah, we have a little video, or on our website you can sign up for it to be delivered to your mailbox, so yeah. they can watch it. And that's a different video than what we're going to show, obviously for the summit. That's just a little summary with the family and how we trained and how we went and picked out the dogs and socialized them and such. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming on here live and we're grateful to have you guys part of our community as presenters and um, being uh, ready for getting your, your presentation in to this year's summit. And for all of you guys watching uh, as we did this on a recent call, um, I forget presenter said something that was really cool. Uh, Sherry Ross. Um, oh, she said this, that was last week. She was saying, um, to basically pop popcorn up or something. She had some saying that was neat to basically just share your best idea or best takeaway that you got from our live here. And oh, this, really? this is like a live, you know, because this Facebook, this is on Facebook and then we usually take this recording and then put it onto YouTube. And we can uh, read the best practices or what people Yeah, do. and then just because people, you know, everybody's going to watch this. Uh, those of you who are watching live now and also as a replay, just as things kind of hit you when you were watching, you can just post it in the comments because it was really neat on Cherry's call and then people kept commenting after like, oh, because they, you know, like it's done when the live's done and then three days later, uh, three weeks later, there can be more comments coming in. So it's pretty neat. So I just want to encourage you all to do that and then get yourself signed up for the summit um, to the free version. You can also consider some of our paid options as well, um, which are very economical and, and gives you access to all of our past content as well. And um, so any final closing words of wisdom that you guys want to share with us before we end off today? Just enjoy your pup every day. Just enjoy having fun with them and know that they want to enjoy being with you and love games or outings or any interaction. And it's just going to make both your lives better. Agreed. Victor? I second what Miriam said. Just cherish every moment, you know, with, with your dog. And, um, if, of course, if you have any questions about, you know, ways to be more helpful or ways that animals can be more helpful in your life, reach out, ask for help. Awesome. Thank you so much. Perfect, guys. Thanks so much. We'll see you later. And thanks everybody. For thanks. Have a great weekend since it's uh, the time of this recording. It's Labor Day long weekend, 2019. So enjoy yourselves and have fun. Stay blessed, stay grateful, stay humble and stay hungry. And we'll see you guys on the next call sometime in the future. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.